The Vanderbeekers of 141st Street, Chapter 10. So in Chapter 9, let's talk about that first. Um, Allegra and Isa are going to the bakery. And remember, Jesse tried to talk him out of going. And then when they get there... Benny is kind of rude to um, Isa, and they can't figure out why. And um, remember, Isa wanted to tell him about them moving, and then he acted like he knew, but what he was talking about was what Jesse had said about the dance. And then when they got home, or when um, at home... All of, uh, Mama was packing up things and Oliver and Lainey were taking things out of the boxes and one thing was Oliver's t-shirt and another thing was um, the t-shirt that had a uh, basketball mojo and the other thing was um, some records and Lainey wanted to take them to Miss um, Josie upstairs and then they saw that um, one of them is jazz, and the beat, and they knew that the Beaterman liked jazz, and so then the kids um, took one of the jazz records, Duke Ellington, up and left it uh, by his front door. Okay, <clears throat> chapter ten. The five v uh, the five Vanderbeeker kids were unabashedly eavesdropping on their mother's phone conversation. They knew from her voice and her pacing back and forth across the room that something bad was going down. I'm sorry, Mr. Biederman, that is not enough notice, Mama barked into her cell phone. It's the holidays. We have boxes all over the place. There's absolutely no way. Papa came in from the backyard, wiping his hands on his coveralls. Hey, kids, he boomed. Shh, responded the children, waving him away without taking their eyes off Mama. We're eavesdropping, Hyacinth, Hyacinth said in a loud whisper, holding her index finger to her lips. Mr. Biederman, Mama continued, her voice going up an octave. You realize that the apartment is not going to look its best if you show it now, right? Pause. Okay, fine. Goodbye. Mama stabbed a button on her phone and tossed it onto an end table. The Vanderbeeker kids and Papa surrounded Mama, waiting for an expl explanation. Mama massaged her temples. Mr. Biederman will have a real estate broker start showing the apartment to prospect prospective renters beginning tomorrow. He strongly suggests that we not be in the apartment when it is shown. Mama gritted her teeth when she said strongly, The broker will try to give us at least 24 hours notice. Is that legal? asked Papa shocked. Apparently it's in our lease and we signed off on it. The landlord has the right of entry for the purpose of showing the space to a prospective tenant in the last 30 days of our lease. Mama recited, in a monotone voice. You're kidding, Oliver said flatly, his arms crossed. That makes no sense, cried Jesse. The probability that he could rent this place out would increase significantly if the apartment were vacant. Her eyes flitted between Mama and Papa. She likes math. Landlords can do it, Mama said, but it would have been nice if he didn't. Oh, fudge, there is so much to do. Mama looked at the state of the ground floor. Mr. Biederman's realtor is showing the apartment tomorrow morning at 11. Papa sighed. Hun, why don't I take the kids out while you do some packing? And I'll try to talk to the Biederman, I mean Mr. Biederman, later tonight. Mama nodded, then went up the stairs two at a time. A second later, they heard her dragging more boxes around. Someone else is actually going to live here? In our home? asked Hyacinth worriedly. That blows, Oliver said. He kicked the wall, leaving a black smudge on the white paint. Don't kick the wall, Papa said absently as he adjusted his glasses. Someone's, someone is going to live in my room, Oliver asked. He kicked the wall again. They'll probably make it back into a closet, Jesse said. That's what it was before you were born. But why my books, Oliver sputtered. You know what we need around here, Papa said, attempting to change the anxious mood. Some holiday spirit. Let's get a Christmas tree. That, what's the point? Jessie said, flopping onto the kitchen stool and burying her head in her hands. We'll have to take it down in just a few days anyway. Yeah, said Isa, Oliver and Hyacinth in a dejected, in dejected agreement, while Lainey yelled, tree, 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 I want a tree. 
Everyone stared at Lainey. And we can decorate it, Lainey continued, and put lights up, and the presents go under the tree, and I'm going to make ornaments. She started skipping around the kitchen, and I'm going to give Paganini a big carrot for a present, and I'm going to wrap it. Papa looked at the older kids. So, are we getting a tree, or what? The older kids watched Lainey run over to Paganini, lift up one floppy ear, and whisper all her grand plans for the tree. Okay, said Isa. Fine, said Oliver. I guess, said Jesse. Yeah, said Hyacinth. Papa pulled his coveralls off. Underneath, he was wearing jeans and a t-shirt that read, I'm here because you broke something. That's the Christmas spirit, kids. The Vanderbeeker kids put on their winter gear and headed out the door. Hello, Vanderbeekers, Angie yelled as she raced down the street on her bike. Oliver, you owe me a basketball game. You're on, Oliver yelled back. The window opened on the second floor of the brownstone. Hello, dear ones, called out Miss Josie. Hello, Miss Josie, the kids chorus. Lainey blew kisses to the second floor, which were returned with equal enthusiasm. A gentleman in baggy pants and oversized jacket and headphones swaggered by holding a rhinestone-studded leash attached to a pocket-sized chihuahua. Yo, Vanderbeekers, he said as he fist-bumped each one. Yo, Big Z, they answered. Did you ever notice, Isa said to Jesse, after watching Big Z stride down the street with his chihuahua skipping behind him, that we know everyone in this neighborhood? Jesse nodded. Feels like Sesame Street. It's giving me a Biederman idea, Isa murmured. Jesse studied Isa, wanting to ask more, but then Oliver threw a handful of pine needles on her head, and Jesse's thoughts turned solely to revenge as she chased him down the street. It was a 20-minute walk to the Christmas tree stand, requiring the Vanderbeekers to cross a bridge that connected Harlem to the Bronx. It's tradition, Papa had insisted, when the kids suggested they go to the Christmas tree stand around the corner rather than walking to the Bronx. When I was a little boy, Papa said in his reminiscing voice, my dad took us across the bridge to Mr. Ritchie's Christmas tree stand. This was back when Christmas trees only cost $5, Papa added. The kids nodded. They had heard this story so many times, Jesse could mouth the words along with Papa. One year, my dad broke his arm. He couldn't work for six weeks while it healed, and we had no money for a tree or presents that year. When I walked by Mr. Ritchie's Christmas tree stand one day on the way to the subway, he asked me why we hadn't gotten a tree yet. I told him about my dad's arm, and he had me choose a tree and take it home anyway. He insisted that the tree would brighten up the holiday, and he was right. The tree stand was on a corner right next to a set of basketball courts, and when they got there, they found Mr. Ritchie sitting on a blue plastic milk crate, listening to a portable radio that gave out static in far greater measure than the Tchaikovsky concerto he had it tuned to. When Mr. Ritchie saw them, he stood up and held out a hand to Papa. Good to see you, Mr. Ritchie, Papa said as he clapped another hand on Mr. Ritchie's shoulder. Papa pulled a thick forest green scarf from his backpack and Isa helped Papa wrap it around Mr. Ritchie's neck. From Mrs. Vanderbeeker, Papa explained. Mr. Ritchie fingered the end of the scarf and gave a satisfied nod and a grunt. Lainey grabbed Mr. Ritchie's hand and swung it back and forth. I like your gold tooth, she told him. I want one too. Mr. Ritchie rewarded her with a small smile, his gold tooth glinting against the light of the street lamps. We want a tree, Jessie said to Mr. Ritchie, raising her arm to indicate the height. If the tree was six feet and four inches exactly, it would fit perfectly in our living room. It has to be fluffy, not skinny, Oliver added, his arms splayed wide. We need one with a good straight branch on the top to stick a star on, Hyacinth said. It has to be perfect, Isa said with a soft sigh as she fiddled with the buttons on her coat. While her siblings made demands, Lainey had a different idea of the perfect Christmas tree. It didn't take long for her to select the most crooked, most pathetic, patchiest pine tree in the bunch. Then she coerced Papa into dragging the tree to her sisters and brother. Lainey tugged on Isa's arm to get her attention. This is it, Lainey declared, jabbing her finger at the tree she had chosen. Seriously? Asked Oliver. You want our last Christmas tree to look like it was pulled out of a forest fire? Ollie, Lainey protested, stomping her foot and pouting. I love it. It's cute and tall, and I like the branches, and I want it. 
The siblings looked at each other. Mr. Ritchie watched the Vanderbeekers with his hands clasped behind him, waiting, awaiting the final decision. Isa was the first to cave. Laney has never chosen the tree before, Isa admitted with an indifferent shrug. Yeah, for a reason, Oliver muttered. Come on, Jesse protested. We're supposed to get a tall, fluffy, symmetrical tree. This tree, Oliver pointed to the offending arbor, fulfills exactly zero of our expectations and specifications. I think it looks great, Hyacinth said loyally. After all, Lainey was her roommate. Lainey's face broke into a huge grin that took up half her face. And even Oliver had to admit that it was worth getting an ugly, ugly tree for that smile. I guess the tree is sort of symbolic, Jesse admitted. And I want this one too, Lainey said, grabbing a tiny tree that sat next to Mr. Ritchie's milk crate stool. She thrust it at her dad while bouncing up and down. Give a girl an inch and she'll take a mile, muttered Oliver. Honey, we're not getting two trees, Papa said to Lainey. Not for me, silly, for Miss Josie and Mr. Jeet. Laney said. Papa relented. Mr. Ritchie wrapped the tree in netting while Papa pulled out his wallet to pay. Laney carried the small tree and Papa hitched the bigger one on his shoulder. The dearth of boughs and pine needles made it light and easy to carry. The Vanderbeekers waved goodbye to Mr. Ritchie and Papa led the way home. They left the Bronx and went back over the bridge. The sun had set behind the castle on the hill and the lights from the city sparkled on the water. A tugboat made its way down the river, causing the water to crash into the rocks along the shorelines. Ten minutes later, the Vanderbeekers rounded the corner onto their sleepy street. The church with the stained glass windows was illuminated from the inside, which gave the building an ethereal look. All down the block, trees were wrapped in twinkling white lights for the holidays. Christmas trees and menorahs were displayed in the windows of many apartments. The red brick brownstone welcomed them home with the glow, warm glow of lamps in the ground floor, first floor and second floor. The top floor was, as usual, hauntingly dark. Oliver opened the basement door just as Mama came down the stairs with a big box in her arms. Home so soon? Mama asked. We got a winner, Papa replied as he screwed the tree onto the holder in the living room. Mama put down her box and inspected it. I think you brought home the wrong tr... Lainey interrupted. Isn't it perfect, Mama? She asked reverently. Or not, Mama finished. She crouched down next to Lainey, who gazed rapturously at the bedraggled tree. Mama took a second look. I think it's lovely, Mama said. Did you choose it yourself? Yes, I did, declared Lainey. By this time, Papa had unearthed the box of Christmas or, uh, decorations from the depths of the hallway closet. The kids surrounded it, eager to see the contents that had been locked away for the past 11 months. Papa lifted the box flaps, and suddenly there were candy canes that were who knows how old, the nativity that was missing Joseph, the snowman, nesting dolls, and the smooth wooden plain ornaments that had belonged to Papa as a child, which Oliver so treasured. It quickly became apparent that this tree offered unique decorating obstacles. The lack of boughs, that means branches, made it difficult to hang the ornaments evenly. So the kids had to hang 10 or more ornaments per branch. Isa and Jesse supervised the decorating, moving ornaments around so the larger ones hung on the back of the boughs and the smaller ones hung on the tips. Mama set out cookies, and after an hour of arranging ornaments and eating cookies and singing and reminiscing about Christmas's past, past, the Christmas trimming was complete. They held their breath as Papa flipped the switch for the tree lights. The tree was proud and majestic. The brownstone walls pulsed from the twinkling Christmas tree, making the walls look like they were breathing. Papa saw the tree and was reminded of the many Christmas trees he had dragged into the brownstone and set up in that exact spot. He couldn't believe this would be his be the last Christmas they would spend here. Mama looked at the tree and remembered her children as toddlers when they used to pull down ornaments. For, for many years they had only decorated the top half of the tree so the ornaments were out, were out of reach. Oliver looked at the tree and then at the cookie platter noticing that only one cookie was left. 
He snatched it before anyone else could beat him to it. Sure, he had already eaten four, but all was fair in love and cookies. Laney looked at the tree and thought how perfect it was. The most perfect tree in the world. Hyacinth looked at the tree, but didn't really see it. She was thinking about a complete stranger moving into the brownstone, into her bedroom. Isa gazed at the tree and thought about her new Biederman idea, while Jessie looked at her sister, wondering when she should tell Isa about Benny. Dawn, dawn, dawn.